This is the story of American freedom. In 1960, America stood at the apex of its moral authority. That magnificent Nargal address by John Kennedy. But the speech brings tears to my eyes. Above all, when I read it as I stand by the grave of John Kennedy. However, Read it carefully. America is prepared to bear any burden and pay any price to ensure the survival and success of freedom. President Kennedy speaks to our old allies of Europe with which we share so many cultural ties. He speaks to the nations of South America promising a new alliance to work together for progress. He speaks to the emerging nations of Asia and Africa. He wants to reach into every hut in every village in the world to bring democracy and prosperity there is not a single word about 10% of the American population. Our African American population. They are totally admitted, uh, omitted from this speech, from these promises. Now, it could not be that Kennedy was unaware that stirring deeply within the African-American community were feelings of the deepest injustice. The name we use today, African-American, was not freely used. In those days, still, one of the polite terms was colored. Negro, which was the term most often used by Martin Luther King, black. But whatever the term, these Americans were not there. Now, they had shed their blood in World War I. In fact, they had won their freedom on the fields of battles of the Civil War. They had been with Teddy Roosevelt up San Juan Hill. They had shed their blood on the Western Front, some of the earliest American troops to go into action in World War I were the Harlem Hellcats. It was said that when the French government tried to offer them the Croix de Guerre, Woodrow Wilson sought to block it. Well, the French assembly answered, we believe in the universal rights of men. And they had fought the battlefields of World War II. In fact, the first integration of the United States Army actually came under General Patton during the Battle of the Bulge when he put rifles into the hands of every soldier in his command and had them fight side by side. So they had fought for this country, they had bled for this country, and yet they were admitted. They were omitted, left out. Now, already in 1955, one of the greatest figures in American history, Martin Luther King, had come to the attention of the nation for leading a boycott in Birmingham, Alabama. Most of you, fortunately, can no longer remember those days. But all through the South, white toilets, 
colored toilets, white schools, colored schools, white drinking fountains, colored drinking fountains. An African American could drive wearily for hours only to find himself in a town where he could not stay in any hotel. He would simply have to, with his family, sleep in his car. Now, his money was good, but he could not take them into a diner, a restaurant, and buy them something to eat. He would have to go around to the back door and once again eat in his car. That was a second-class degrading existence. And it wasn't just in the South. Cities like Boston were racist. Already in the 1930s, the great African-American Olympic champion, Owens, came back from Berlin. And he was asked, what did you think about Hitler's racial laws? And he said, I don't know anything about politics. But in Berlin, when I got on the streetcar, I got in by the front door and sat in the front seat. When I came back to Cleveland, I was ordered to the back door and had to sit in the back seat, no matter how many Olympic medals I had won. Well, it was an evil system. And it was enforced with great brutality. Now the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments passed after the Civil War had been seen and envisioned by the great Lincoln as bringing equality to the African American ending slavery, ensuring that every citizen of the United States had an equal right to life, liberty, and property. And giving to the African American male the right to vote. Well, in one of the most sordid political deals in this country's history, those rights were stripped away. Oh, slavery wasn't reinstituted. But the African American was reduced in the South to a status not far beyond it by being a tenant farmer, completely at the mercy of a new form of white master. See, in 1876, there was a disputed election and it was thrown into a congressional committee and the deal was made that um, Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, would be named President of the United States. But in return, the federal troops that had been occupying the South, in many cases trying to ensure the right to vote for African Americans, their right to hold public office, they would be withdrawn. And the South reverted reverted to a system of denying by chicanery the vote to the African American, making sure they held no public office. And if they got out of line, from the white perspective, they were lynched in the most brutal fashion, subjected to every form of brutality. And this went right on up until 1960 beatings in jail, charged with false crimes. And nowhere does Kennedy mention them. But in 1955, fresh with his PhD from Boston University, Martin Luther King set out to change things. His name had originally been Michael like his father, a minister. But the father had changed both their names in a very symbolic act. As Martin Luther 
stood up against a corrupt establishment, so Martin Luther King Jr. would feel compelled to stand up against a corrupt establishment. Stand up not with violence, for there were many African Americans calling for violence, but by moral conscience, by the freedom of your conscience, by appealing to what was best in Americans, their conscience. His great hero was Gandhi of India, who by non-violent resistance, not passive resistance, as Gandhi was quick to emphasize, there was nothing passive about his resistance, but by non-violent resistance had brought down, down the great British Empire, wading into ranks of British policemen, bashing in their heads and shaming Britain before the world. So Gandhi was a hero of Martin Luther King, and today at his magnificent museum in Atlanta, there is a statue of the great Gandhi the great soul. So he began in 1955 a boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, the seat of the first government of the Southern Confederacy. Well, the merchants of Montgomery seemed willing enough to accept our money. The bus company will allow us to ride on its buses and pay full fare, but make us sit in the back. We'll boycott those buses. We'll boycott those businesses. You'll get lynched, his father warned him. Maybe I will. But I feel called by God to do this. And throughout his bold and brave life, King had a deep sense of a calling and a mission from God to bring true freedom to this country. Well, the boycott turned out to be more successful than King had hoped. The African Americans maintained it. They'd walk to work. They'd come in mule carts. But they wouldn't ride those buses. And thus, by 1960, the Civil Rights Movement was in full swing. And it struck a chord with those young, idealistic Americans, white and African American alike, and thus, the summer of 1961, they began to travel through the South. They began to demand registration for African Americans to vote. They would sit side by side in diners, daring the police to come in and arrest them. And the police were only too willing to do so with a strong use of their batons beating these demonstrators or, as they were called in the South, outside agitators, communist agitators. And indeed, the civil rights movement was seen as a communist conspiracy. And King himself was branded as a communist. Pretty early on in his career, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover began to keep a dossier on him to wiretap into his telephones trying to prove that he was a communist. No, he was an American who believed in freedom. Kennedy didn't know what to do with this. He was worried about carrying the South. 
And he was afraid he might lose the next election if he stood too strongly behind this civil rights movement. King met with the Kennedy on more than one occasion. He was not especially impressed with Kennedy's commitment to the civil rights movement. And then on a sweltering August day in 1963, King led one of the greatest marches, one of the greatest demonstrations in American history, right in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial, and called out in one of the grandest orations in American history. For he was the most powerful speaker in American history. It was a remarkable combination. He was a minister, and he spoke in the tones of a minister. He spoke in the tones of a black minister, in the tones of a revival. But it was mixed with erudition. He had written a letter from a Birmingham jail to well-meaning white ministers calling upon him to go cautiously. I am telling them and quoting from Paul, from Cicero, from St. Thomas Aquinas, reminding them about natural law. And he took us in this August speech, this sweltering summer of the Negro's discontent right out of Richard III. He reminded us that we were founded on the principles that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with the unalienable right of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We are still waiting for that to be granted to us. It was a promissory note in 1776. It cannot be any longer a promissory note. We want it now. We want freedom to ring throughout this land. And do not think you can wait. I call for a peaceful change to this segregation. But there are many who will come after me who will use violence to bring it to an end. And the heart of a nation was moved. And the movement only gained strength after the assassination of Kennedy. And the president, it see, was taken up by Lyndon Johnson, a Texan. But he would do more than any other white to achieve this equality, culminating in the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Johnson himself, using King's words, the words of an old Negro spiritual, we shall overcome. In fact, King had met with Johnson and he came out of the meeting and said, you know, that damn cracker Johnson is going to do more for us than John Kennedy ever would have. Well, the wiretaps continued. And King, having achieved this great goal, began to move on. He began to question the war in Vietnam. Why are we fighting a war thousands of miles away to bring our democracy to another people? Let us achieve it here in our countries first. How is this a war any different from a colonial war by the British? 
a war of imperialism by the French. Why are African American men and poor white men, why are they the ones fighting this war and dying? Where is the cause for it? You can never achieve by force true freedom. Well, now, wait a minute, he was getting out of line for Johnson. Oh, no, we can't have that. I've done all of this for the African American. How dare they question my foreign policy? But then King went on and questioned, you have seen the American, the African American, gain his freedom to vote. An ending to segregation. But that will all be meaningless if that African American cannot feed his family or her family. Our wages are far below those of whites. Our opportunities for jobs are far below those of whites. This economic system is as corrupt and unjust as segregation itself. Thus he took up the cause of the poor, like the garbage collectors in Memphis. And he marched with them. When he was in Memphis, early April, he was so tired and worn out, so weary of giving speech after speech after speech. But he was going to be introduced that night. All he wanted to do was stand up, take some applause. But the crowd wouldn't have it. They had to have a speech. And there on the spot, he gave one of the most brilliant and moving of all of his speeches. With its premonition, that he would die, die early. I may not get to the promised land, he said, but we as a people will get there. And on April the 4th, 1968, he was shot dead by a still unknown assassin. But he had achieved for freedom in this country as much as I dare say so. The founders are Abraham Lincoln or Franklin Roosevelt by sheer force of conscience and by appealing to what was best in the Americans. The war in Vietnam it was reaching its height in 1968 when King was assassinated. I'm often asked, how did we get into a war in Vietnam, this war that King opposed? Well, it was a very natural development. We were the bastion of freedom. King reminded us that we must be a bastion of freedom at home as well as abroad, but we were the bastion of freedom abroad. We had entered into these treaty arrangements. NATO to protect Europe and the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization to protect the countries of Southeast Asia from a communist takeover from a takeover by China. And in fulfillment of that pledge, already under President Kennedy, we had begun to send in troops, first as advisors into Vietnam, and then under President Johnson, more and more troops until an enormous American military presence was established. It was guided by the use of history, by historical thought. And as Winston Churchill said, history can be an impediment as well as a guide. 
Sometimes history can lead you astray. And men like George Marshall, men like Lyndon Johnson, they were guided by the world as it had been seen in the 1930s in retrospect. That world that had former Britain and France appeased Hitler, allowed him step by step to spread his evil totalitarian government. We were determined not to allow that to happen again. The Berlin Wall, that was seen as one such step, one such appeasement. And now Korea, that was another such step by the communist and appeased in the form that we made a stalemate. And now by 1964, Vietnam, another bold step by China using its proxy North Vietnam to take over South Vietnam. And if South Vietnam were allowed to fall, then the whole of Southeast Asia would fall. Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, all of these would become communist. So we had to stop it there or we would end up fighting the communists, the Chinese, in San Francisco. And once we were in the, in the war, it proved very difficult to get out. How could President Johnson withdraw the forces without victory. But victory was so elusive. We found ourselves fighting a, a colonial war, like the French before us in Indochina. We were not wanted there. It's a lesson we still can't learn. Don't go where you're not wanted. The South Vietnamese did not want us there. We were there supporting a corrupt government. Much of the aid that we poured in went into the pocket of corrupt generals and politicians. The North Vietnamese were brave and bold. They had a great deal of support in the villages and towns and cities of Vietnam. They were willing to die for their ideals. The South Vietnamese did not feel that way. This soon became America's war. And in bloody battles, their names ominously reminiscent of World War I and II, places like Hamburger Hill became slaughter grounds for American boys. Up and down that same bloody hill. But this time, unlike World War I and II, the press was not on their side. Very early on, the press began to see this as a war gone terribly wrong. Began to count up the enemy losses the body count, and some journalists and even politicians came to understand that these figures sent out by the United States military were grossly inflated. If you took them at face value, the United States had probably killed the population of North Vietnam, Vietnam the whole population, three times over. But nuclear weapons were not a possibility. Indeed, there was no front line in this war. Endless forays into the jungle. Endless losses. Until finally, 56,000 Americans would die. And those who came back home, unlike World War I, unlike World War II, did not have Victory parades down Main Street. No, they came home alone. 
They wore their uniforms. They were spat upon. Their memory disgraced. They had died just as surely for their country as any other American soldiers. But to me today there is no more somber monument in Washington, no sadder monument than that simple black graven stone with the name of all those brave Americans. Thus the war in Vietnam by 1968 had the American people bitterly divided. If you even question the war, you were a communist sympathizer. The press openly attacking the president and his war policies and calling for an end to the war. The war seemed unwinnable, but more and more troops kept pouring in. That war in Vietnam, that would erode forever the moral authority of the United States, erode forever the ideal of the United States as a bastion of freedom. Was it not, just as the communists said, one more imperialistic power determined to force capitalism and all of its worst excesses upon a colonial people, a people that only wanted to be free and united. But at home, it unleashed an avalanche of revolt against moral authority. It unleashed a chaos such as America, the John Kennedy of 1960, never could have imagined and challenged the very concept of freedom as it had been founded, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, challenged the very validity of those ideas, or at best, saw them only as hypocrisy. The Story of Freedom in America with Dr. J. Rufus Fears is made possible by the generous support of our freedom and heritage sponsors. The Story of Freedom in America is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma in partnership with the Alumni Association of the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.